<laughs> All right. So this is Lit Coach Connection. I'm Krista Senator. And I'm Shelly Fenton. And we're yes. so excited to welcome uh, Paula Burke, the author of Spark, uh, Quick Rights to Kindle Hearts and Minds in Elementary Classrooms. And we feel so fortunate absolute, to have her here and to share some of her thoughts and uh, you know, uh, kind of expand our thinking after reading the book. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so, so Paula, um, we've been using Paula's book this summer um, to, to kind of spark our connected writing teachers group and have been reading it and talking about the first couple chapters and now are really into the part where we're trying the sparks out. So we've done some informational quick writes and we're moving into some other types of quick writes as well. Um, so a quick question for you, Paula, how, so say you're a teacher, how do you get this work off the ground? So as a coach, I would come in and, into classrooms and work with the teachers to try to help them do that. So there's a couple of different ways that I've done that, but for the most part, what I tried to do is ask them, do you have students who are reluctant writers in your classroom? And if they said yes, which 99.9% .9 do is say, um, you know, like, let's talk to them about what writing is. And so sometimes we ask it, we start with a conversation. What do you think writing is? What's writing for? Why do we write? And a lot of times their definition or, or their understanding of writing is really narrow. And so um, we talk a little bit about how writing is just a different way of thinking. And um, so, and I, first I talk to the teachers too, but a lot of them, what we'll do is um, you, you just kind of jump right in with it. And so it could be that could, your first quick write could be like, what do you think writing is? Or why do we write mm -hmm. something like that? Um, and then we go kind of walk through the process of sharing all the different things that people think about writing. Um, we talk about how, introduce how you share writing. Kids always have the option of not sharing if they don't want to share their writing. Um, and then we have some like protocols and ground rules for sharing. And so um, when somebody, when one person's sharing, the rest of us are not writing or looking at our piece. Um, we try to um, piggyback on other kids thinking. It's either like in addition to what, what so-and-so said, or I had something different than what so-and-so said. So it sounds like you're connecting to somebody else's piece and not just waiting to share your own piece of writing. You know, it's not like, I'm not listening to you. I'm just waiting to share my piece, which right. happens a lot. Um, and then we talk about how it can be just for lots of different kinds of writing. And then I'll share with the teachers some of the different sparks to get trying. And usually I don't, I'm only in the building one day a week and then I have to come back to see how it's going. Um, and usually within that week, it's, it's sparked. I mean, it really, it really take, does take off. So, and um, we were talking before we started here a little bit about how sometimes it's kind of hard to stop writing. So we keep them really short intentionally um, because what we want kids to understand is that the, the only thing that we ask is that you write the whole time. And if the whole time is 20 minutes, that's impossible. But if the whole time is three to five minutes and we start small sometimes, everybody can do it. And we talk about if you don't know what to write, you can start with, I'm really stuck with what to write right now. And you just write down whatever you're thinking, sort of stream of consciousness. Because the idea is to just kind of get that connection between your brain and your, and your pencil or your keyboard or whatever, get that connection going. Um, and you're just writing the whole time. So if it's a short amount of time, they often say, I'm not finished, I'm not finished. And I'll tell them, you know, stop right in the middle of the word you are. I've talked to so many authors who say that's something that they tend to do is they'll, they'll mm -hmm. stop mid-sentence. Yeah. And the kids are like, oh, I, I can't stop mid-sentence. Yeah, um, right. And the authors say, because then what I do is I go, I pick up my writing, I read, I get to that point in the middle of that sentence where I stopped and I know exactly where to get started again. And so it just can keep flowing. If you, if you feel like you finished a piece, then you're probably not going to go back and revisit it ever. And if so, if you're mid-piece, it's an invitation to go back and revisit, which we want kids to be able to do with their writing. So that's kind of how, that's in a nutshell, kind of how we get started. So would you have time each day for a different spark or, and then invite children during different times of the day to keep working on that piece of writing? So I'll talk with teachers about what are your goals? What do you want to accomplish with this? If it's just, you know, you want to try a variety of things, then we pull out different kinds of sparks. Um, okay. Sometimes they want to stick with one for like a week so the kids can kind of internalize an expectation of like, you know, how to, they can anticipate what they're supposed to be working on and it's, 
it, you, when you know your kids, like the kids who have the really tough writer's block, I think it often works well to kind of stick with one till they get a little comfort level with it before introducing a variety, you know what I mean? So that they feel mm -hmm. like every day is not going to be like, now I don't know what to do. Now I don't know what to do. So we might stick with a, a you know, a, a type of spark for a while. Okay. Um, it's different with different teachers. Usually it's just like, what do you, what do you want to accomplish with your kids? And if it's just for them to start trying thinking in lots of different ways, we'll, we'll do different sparks, but, um, and they don't always have to be on paper. I have a couple of teachers who start with the whiteboard spark. I don't know if you guys got to that part in the book, but mm -hmm. you, you, know, you just kind of come in and there's usually some kind of spark on the board and you just go up and you just do, you just respond to that. So that's, that's one form that you can do. That's pretty simple. And then, you know, you can add to your repertoire during the day too. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so then, so Shelly and I were talking actually before, um, before you joined us, Shelly had a question about mini lessons. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to jump in with that. Um, yeah, um, what I kind of found myself is I happen to be trying out the one where you're doing a quick write off of a book trailer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've done book trailers, but really I never really thought about the different components of a book trailer. So then I kind of went off and did a little research on it. Um, and then when I really thought about like, what are all the components someone should have and to make it interesting and so forth. And then I wrote off one that you shared. So I kind of made like a little mini anchor chart, but then I'm like, am I taking this too far? You know, am I creating an right. extended mini lesson and you know what I mean for what this total purpose is? So, uh, yeah, that, I mean, that's a great question because a lot of times when I work with teachers, it's what purpose drive your process so like what what's your purpose if you really want kids to have an opportunity to analyze what goes into a book trailer and you want to start with some quick writes to, to kind of get them going that that's a perfect use of it like a lot of times teachers just use the book trailer ones just to get kids thinking about books and right and and connected to books and um so it's i don't i don't feel like there's a right or a wrong but my, my that whole idea of kind of with spark is it's less of a mini lesson and just an opportunity to kind of put your thinking on paper. Um, but it doesn't mean somebody couldn't use it for those, for that as well. And, too. and I, I guess I just got excited thinking about that part of it. And then when I got all done, I was kind of like, well, I've turned this into something else. Right. I was feeling that way, but there's no longer a spark, you know? Um, so I was just kind of wanted your thinking on that. Well, and that's it. You know, a spark can spark some other thing teaching thing too that right. you do too so yeah. a lot of times I'll, I'll do some quick writes with kids and it makes me think you know what we need to work more on something it's it's almost a formative assessment about what they need to learn more right. about you absolutely use it for, you know if you realize it's hey this would be something I'd like my kids to learn then just take right. it take it to the direction you want it to go with sure mm-hmm Oh, neat yeah we were talking to sharing as well that sometimes I find I, I scaffold too much and so I think of your sparks is just put it out there and see right what the kids come up yeah, with. My three, my three favorite prompts uh, are really like, what are you thinking? What are you wondering? What are you feeling? And like, okay. so, so, so sort of like the difference between a prompt and a spark. Um, I see prompts okay. as actions, sort of like, they'll show you an image and be like, think about a time when, or write a story about this girl, or like it, it gives you the direction kind of with it. Whereas what I, hope a spark is is just that kids kids see something or hear something or experience something and their own reaction or response starts to become natural you know like they're going to have a response to something we all respond to things but sometimes we don't pay attention to it and so getting them to think about all right every time we share a spark with you it's not like write a story like sometimes kids think right. writing is narrative. Everything's narrative. Mm -hmm. um, it's not necessarily like write a description of what do you see, but it's a lot of times it's like, you know, what are you thinking about this? And then for some kids, it might be, they start making connections. It reminds me of this, or it sort of looks like this thing. Um, if I say, what are you wondering? That invites them. Like we really want kids to be curious, more curious about things. What are you wondering? And so kids start asking questions. Um, you know, what are you feeling about this? And then that, just be ready when you ask kids what you're feeling. Like a lot of times <laughs> they really want to open up about what they're feeling um, about things. And so 
it, it's not giving them a direction. They're, they can go any, any way they want with it. Sometimes, right. like if you look in the book, sometimes the sparks are a little bit more directed, but if a kid takes off and starts going, actually, I'm really wondering what blah, 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 blah. It, that's, that's the whole idea is like the spark kind of is a scaffold for them to put their thinking on paper. But if they want to take it a, a totally different way, then that's perfect. That's exactly what we want them to do is, is to have their own personal response to, to things and, and, and share it or document it or explore it in writing. Um, so and that makes me think a little bit about that share piece that seems so critical because I'm just thinking you could say you threw a, a photograph and er, each of the 20 something kids in your room could have a different response to it or could make them think a different thing. Right. Um, and so, so, so sometimes um, and I talk a little bit about when kids share is, you know, my response to their sharing is really going to be critical in whether or not they're going to want to continue to share or they're going to feel like their, their thing is valued. And, and so sometimes it's that whole notice and naming. Oh, I noticed you wrote a story is, is all I say, or, Oh, I noticed you asked some questions or, Oh, I noticed you had some wondering so that, I can just sort of label the writing move that they did so other kids can go, oh yeah, I didn't think about writing questions. Maybe the next time they, they will. Um, mm -hmm. So that it opens up that whole, you know, panorama of options that kids could have um, mm -hmm. just by my response to them, you know. So one of the questions, Paula, that we got from the group um, was kind of wondering, um, when you get to that share piece, when the peers are sharing with each other, um and you have a stronger writer mm. um yeah. who's more of a reluctant writer mm -hmm. um you know can you speak to how you might handle that or uh kind of set it up ahead of time at the beginning of the year when you're kind of talking about your share time just so that that yeah. reluctant reader still feels confident enough to keep on writing and that their writing is valued right so um, the other big thing that I really am trying to focus on is us expanding our definition of what writing is so that everybody feels like they have a place at the table. And one of the ways that I do that is, is to value and honor and model sort of non, um, narrative forms of writing. And so sometimes I, I'll take a spark and I might just like do bursts of words. This may, you know, this mm. word. And so it's just words. And it's not connected thought. And then, so I might share that and kids are like, that doesn't make sense. I'm like, well, what doesn't make sense? They're like, well, you, you didn't write sentences. And I, then I'll say, oh, mm -hmm. did, did we say we had to write sentences? I'm yeah. sorry. Let me just yeah. be clear. Writing, there's so many forms of writing or bulleted lists. Um, I do a lot of sketch noting um, with writing. So I'm trying to pull in more visuals sometimes in my sketch, in my um, sparks, I might do, uh, a quick little sketch and just label a few things. I might um, do a quick little sketch and some thought bubbles of what I'm wondering, what I'm wondering. Um, we have a lot of ELL kids, ESL kids in our district who come to us no English whatsoever. Right. But everybody at the table can draw a stick person and know that it's a, a human being. So um, what I'm really careful about though is not just saying, you know, um, picking on one of not picking, but choosing one of those students, and, you know, oh, Hussein, you drew a great picture. Um, Mary, you wrote a great narrative, you know. Um, right. I want to make sure, like, I'm picking examples of kids who wouldn't typically maybe draw a picture and say, oh, you know, Marty, would you, sh would you share your quick write today? It's, you, you did a little different form of writing, you know, that you could share with the kids, and oh, Marty's drawing pictures too. Well, if Marty can draw pictures, maybe I can draw pictures. So it's, there's a whole lot of thinking that has to go into like, how can I not um, be evaluative? Cause it really, the whole idea is like, you know, it's non-judgmental. It's, it's, you're really trying to raise the, the risk taking for kids, but there's so many times there's things that you don't even think about that go into making sure kids feel like this is acceptable. And especially if I, if I do quick writes that don't look like the narrative forms and I share those frequently and it's then, and, you know, sometimes as soon as a teacher does something, a lot of kids try it, you know. Right. So I want to make sure Giving that I'm. permission. Right. I, I, I want to yeah. make sure I don't make the student, the example student be the one that that's the best kind of writing that they could possibly do. You know, I, I can't write words, but I can do this. Um, 
I want to make sure I have a wide range of people who can do those different ones. So that's a, that's a big way that I, that I'll try to do that. Great. Thank you. That makes sense. Great. That's great. Uh, I'm trying to think what else. So I know you speak in the book about um, the intradependence mm -hmm. that comes from quick rights. Can you speak a little bit more about that and the, just the importance of the share? Sure. So like that, yeah. sometimes like I think about, you know, kids feel like writing is an independent activity. And so it's, mm -hmm. you know, you're kind of on your own, but then there's like this, sometimes they have this idea of, I'm going to work with a partner or we're going to work together or collaborate or something. And I, I think of that as more interdependence, like you're working together kind of towards a common kind of piece of writing. It could be the same piece of writing or it's like, we're all writing this essay on the American flag. So everybody has an essay and they see each other's examples, but it's all coming to this one product. You know, that's more interdependence. You can learn from each other towards that same kind of, project that you're working on. Whereas the idea I, I really want to foster is that idea of interdependence. We can learn, we can widen our understanding of what writing is and our, um, we can see unique ways to approach a piece of writing, different entry points into writing because we're not all, you might have the same spark, but your end piece doesn't necessarily ever have to be the same kind of. Mm. And so we're going to learn about writing from one another, but not because we're working on a similar project together over time or um, having the same goal um, or working on the same standard or anything like that. So it's learning um, from one another about how writing works because we, we have a variety and a wide range of um, abilities, topics, genres, approaches, entry points um, uh, that expand what we think of writing is. And so the, the share is where they're going to see that because obviously writing right is a pretty isolated um, activity usually. Like in writing workshop, um, which we'll talk about the difference between quick writes and yeah. writing workshop is, you know, kids really do have to spend some time. It's, it's them and that, that, that piece of writing. You know, they're having this transactional moment with, you know, future writers maybe, but I think a lot of our kids don't think about writing that way. It's like getting it on the paper and getting it to the teacher kind of a thing, but it, it can be kind of a lonely sport um, to work on a piece of writing until the <laughs> teacher comes. You know, everybody wants to confer with the teacher because it's like, I need some, I need some human contact during writing. <laughs> <That's a good> <laughs> point. <laughs> you know, it's like, can we work with partners? It's like, not necessarily because they think the partner's going to lift their writing, but it's just like <laughs> lonely over here with me in this, this paper. Um, so that's where I think, you know, keeping it short and quick and having opportunities to share with one another um, <laughs> builds that community too around that. So anyway, it makes it a little less lonely to be a writer, I think sometimes. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, Paula, I, um, it was interesting. Of course, I've shared uh, your book with a lot of teachers and I have uh, sixth and seventh grade teachers that are very oh, yeah. excited, that um, tried a little bit at the end of the school year. Yeah. Um, we're going to do some curriculum writing um, in just a couple of weeks, and this is definitely part of it. So I was just curious. I know we we went back and forth a little bit on email as to why uh, it seemed like your target was elementary when writing this book. Right. So a couple of things. Like, um, I definitely will use this with middle and high school. Um, but I, as a literacy coach, I work K to six, and mm. so the the personal examples and the, and the lessons that I worked were with K to six students and mm -hmm. in conversations with my editor, you know, she thought it'd be best to keep it at what you teach because the books that I write tend to be like, here's what we do. Um, right. it's not necessarily, you know, I'm, I'm an in the classroom ongoing teaching author. So, you know, I, I use these things every day. Um, so my, I work K to six and so she said, let's keep that as your target audience. Um, I've worked with, the, you know, I've shared these with our middle school teachers. Um, I have Andy, Andy Shinburn. He's, he's amazing. Um, high school teacher who's shared with me all the quick writes he does with his high school students. Mm -hmm. um, and he's like, you should, this should be for high school. I said, well, it can be. And it, that's the hard thing when you're trying to like market um, a book. It's right. like, you know, you have to have a target audience. And there are some, um, I'll tell you your middle school teachers too. Like, I think, um, Linda Reef's um, Quick Write Handbook is amazing. She 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 uses pieces of writing to look for writing. Like she uses pieces of literature 
um, poetry and images and things like that to kind of mine writing. Um, so her, um, her use of quick writes is really, you know, more of a, an ELA kind of classroom okay. and it's um, amazing. So, and she's got a middle school and high school kind of target audience. And so, and her book came out the year before this one did. So we really thought let's kind of keep the audience oh. um, K to six, but I, I would definitely use it. Um, you're going to have reluctant writers in middle school and high school. You're going to mm -hmm. have kids who need to like initiate pieces of writing over and over again. I mean, um, writer's block doesn't stop once kids know how to write, you know, then it often gets worse because they know what they want to write and they can't write it the way they want it to. Um, so I think that, you know, using quick writes in middle school would be fantastic for kids who are intimidated, you know, as right to be right, to be consider themselves writers. So. And when I work with teachers, I think, you know, um, more limited with time that they have is sometimes in middle school and high school. Absolutely. Um, but I think they're, they're very assignment driven sometimes. Right. Um, so I think once the students get, got more used to it, it was very freeing to them to have that opportunity just to, to get um, some thoughts down that weren't necessarily tied to an assignment or tied to a grade. Um, I agree because I, our middle school, I don't know how yours, but I think a lot of our, you know, everybody has like these 90 minute blocks or eight, maybe it's 80 minute blocks. And for ELA, that's reading and writing. Yes. You know, every right. day. So it's like you either have, you're either doing a unit where you're doing a lot, a lot of writing or a lot of reading, or you're trying to do both in a 80 minute block. Um, and so kids, like they might only get exposure to one genre for eight weeks. Mm -hmm. And you know, they need to be like dipping their toe back into all these other kinds of writing frequently or they get rusty. They're like, oh, we haven't done that. So we didn't do that since seventh grade or mm -hmm. whereas if they can just get little tastes of it every day through the year, you know, they're not going to get quite so rusty is, is my hope, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I hear that all the time and teachers will say, you know, I'm asking them to do narrative in April, but I taught it in September and you know the kids have forgotten so much, and so yeah. that's that's one of the things when I've talked to teachers about quick writes, I, I really push that idea. Yeah, and I, I think it's that all or nothing mentality. Well, I don't have time right. to do another narrative unit. And it's like nope, but kids can try little narrative techniques, yeah. and they can they can start a story, or they can try to dip in. You know, um, think about where it would be a cool entry point for this cool story. Entry, cool entry, and just. The, the idea that they can like just sample it, sample it here and there. I'm getting some, I'm getting some pack. Oh yeah, feedback so going. Let me try. Is that you? Or is that us? I don't know. Can you hear? Is it feedback now? No, that okay. sounds good. All right, I yeah, just want to your mind in case sometimes there's a little weird thing with that too. Oh, okay. So if Possibly. you hear family out there or me. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of that. Um, how do you encourage teachers to add quick writes to their already packed day? Okay, so I have to do it by example. I have to come in and show them how quick it can be because, I mean, most of us, we take a mini lesson and it's a maxi lesson real quick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what I'll do is I'll come in and I'll show them. I'll say, you got five minutes? And they'll say, yeah, I got five minutes right after lunch. They're kind of settling in. Now, you know, I'm, great, tell me whatever it is you need. You need. And I'll, what I'll do is try to come in and show them how fast it can be. And the idea, like, you know, when that five minutes is over, you're done. They're like, oh, well, a lot of the kids hardly got started. I'm like, that's right. You know, over yeah. time, you're going to start noticing they get, they're going to get longer. But I think some teachers are like, well, they really didn't get much written. So I let them go a little bit longer. Yeah. I go, <laughs> no, no, no. You know, the whole idea is that you want kids to see the, the power of these. And so if they have a notebook and at the beginning, they only had two or three words in five minutes and then, you know six, seven weeks mm -hmm. later, they're, they've got a half a page. They have, you know, there's their evidence of learning. There's their evidence of proficiency. There's their evidence of the power of being able to like to, to try this as a strategy. So I tell them, no, 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 just who cares if they only have a few words right now. Okay. When everybody shares and they only have two words, there's some super motivation for the next time to get a few more words down maybe. So, um, I think that's what I, you know, the best way is like to lead by example. So I'll come in and, and mm. show how that, how that might work with them. Um, and, and what I tell them is like, you can't do it. It's not wrong. You know, if the kids don't write much right now, that's okay. Or if they, if they didn't write on topic, Hey, that's okay. Like there is no on topic with quick writes. So it's, it's really freeing. I think sometimes for teachers to go, Hey, I got five minutes. Um, 
And especially if you try like a variety of things or maybe it, they do it on post-it notes or they can do it on Google Classroom or they can do it on their whiteboard if they're kind of tired of their notebooks. I, I do like keeping a notebook for that idea of being able to go back and mine ideas later or being able to look for, um, you know, you've got this whole learning history right there in front of you. You got, you can start to look for patterns. How do I usually typically start? you know, a piece of writing. And some kids really, they have five pages in a row where they start exactly the same way. They, then you can talk about why is it important to vary your leads. They're like, oh yeah, my, mine are the same all the time. Mm. Recognize that for themselves. It's, it can be really powerful. So, um, you know, you just got to kind of jump in and you have to like not be afraid to go done, done for the day, you know, and keep, if, if the share is only one minute, that's great too. You know, everybody isn't going to get to share out loud, one at a time. So that's where it's, there's lots of good turn and talk opportunities to share with the person next to you real quick right. so that everybody gets an opportunity. And do you, so that makes me think, do you, do you recommend there be a separate quick write notebook separate from the writer's notebook or is it fine to have just one notebook? The teachers that tend to keep, they keep a separate one. So, they do. okay. So um, a fourth grade teacher that I work with, they have a section that's for their read aloud. Then they have, they have their, um, in the morning, she, she sometimes has the whiteboard thing. And if they want to write their thing, she has the whiteboard message when they first, right. it. And if they want to transfer what they put on theirs into their, into their notebook, they can too. Um, she'll say, turn to your science. You know, she has different sections. And so it's like, they can do a quick write on site. They just have it all right there kind of a thing. But right. I mean, trial and error you know as teachers like what the way you do it one year doesn't work with that group but it might work with the next group but you might we're always switching it up so but having having some place where kids can reflect on their writing really helps to build that writing identity so that's kind of why we kind of try to keep it a little bit separate from um like the, the writer's notebook for um writing workshop we tend to practice something and then the kids can you know, we might say we're going to practice leads, we're going to practice word choice, you know, and they have a section for practicing and then they're going to write their narrative. Um, whereas quick writes aren't necessarily for them to practice something that they're going to immediately apply. Um, they might not apply it. They might not even think they're applying it, but just the practice of doing it mm. um, internalizes something for them. So I don't want them to feel like it has to be a mini lesson, you know. So it's really making that distinction. Yeah. Between yeah. the two. And do you find sometimes students will lift ideas from the quick write notebook and then develop it and play with it more in the writer's notebook? I've seen kids like they'll go, Oh, remember that remember that one picture you shared with us? I turned that into a story this week. Or yeah. So they'll go yeah. back and put some things out of there. Um, the ones that are kind of stick with them and are, me are memorable. And the ones that they don't finish too are the ones that they tend to go back and and are intrigued to go back and revisit and work on a little bit more. Sometimes. Okay. Um, Paul, I was wondering, do you encourage the teachers that you work with to sit down and and do the quick writes while their students are writing? Mm -hmm. That um, good question. Yeah, there's a couple of teachers who use that opportunity to go around and observe, and I totally value that. And there's a couple that they do the quick write every day too, because they it, it's pretty powerful. Because like you discover what you were. You don't know you were thinking something sometimes until you sit down yeah. and write it. And I've had some mom go, I didn't even know, you know, I didn't even know I was thinking that. And you're like, yep, that's what we want our kids to experience too. Or a combination of both. But what I would say right. is like, you know, that's your time. Think about what's your purpose. Do I, do I want to see who, who needs help getting initiated? Who, who's losing stamina? Then you want to take that time to observe. So maybe a couple days a week you want to write and a couple days a week you want to observe. Um, it's kind of like when we first started doing SSRs or, um, you know, everybody drop everything and read and teachers like, well, I'm going to take that time to read too. And then um, a lot of us were going, well, I need that opportunity to work with my kids. But mm -hmm. I, you know, um, so some teachers will do, I'm just going to read for two or three minutes and then I'm going to circle around or, you know, you just really have to think about what's your, what's your purpose and what's going to meet my kids needs. And um, sometimes we just want to read too, but <laughs> yeah I just want to write too so give yourself that permission so that makes me think about um you know some of us use units of study and how so I'm wondering like how do quick writes impact sort of the more formal types of writing that we ask students to do in a unit right 
So one of the things I think that's really powerful is if you do units of study, um, quick writes were designed to like be used outside of writing workshop. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're going to be really intense and working hard at a unit. Um, you don't do quick writes that are that type of genre at the same time. Try other things. Like, again, like kind of dip in your toe in different waters during the day. Um, so the kids get, you know, it's like cross training for, for exercise. You know, if you're, um, you know, you're uh, a swimmer and you're in the pool all the time, that's the only exercise you ever get. You're going to, you're going to build certain muscles, but others are going to, you know, so you might want to jump in the gym and pump some, pump a few weights. You know, you can think of quick rights as being something like that. Um, it's really good. It should enhance, you know, your writing, um, because it's every opportunity on paper, um, that, that kids are writing has got has got to be improving. It's got to help them be thinking about you know themselves as writers and getting ideas down and building stamina, um, how to say things in different ways. Uh, so I I mean I really think of it almost as cross training. You know, so you've got your unit of study and then you've got your quick write that's just a little little bit of exercise, uh, fun exercise in a different way kind of a thing. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And do you find that doing quick writes has an impact on those more formal pieces of writing? What I will say is I found the writer's block to diminish greatly because okay. the time, I think the hardest thing for kids is initiating a piece of writing. It's so intimidating to look at that piece of paper. Um, artists have the same, you know, like they look at it, that blank canvas kind of a thing. You hear that. Um, when you have to start a piece of writing every day, for the whole school year, or sometimes a couple of times a day, um, on a moment's notice, you, you, you learn how to break down that barrier and just kind of get started. You know, um, you don't want to let perfect be the enemy of good or, you know, whatever that yeah. is. Um, they just realize, you know what, getting crap down is better than getting nothing down, you know, over time. Um, and so that's probably the place where I see the biggest. The other is like, I think kids get to play with different, um, different ways of writing things and it kind of creeps, you know, they might play around with dialogue a bit more. They might, you know, there's, I'm trying to, th I can't really think of a kid's example where I went, that's a result of quick writes necessarily. Um, other than kids will be like, th they'll pull things from their quick writes and put it in their story. Sometimes they tell me about that. I often don't know what their process is because they're not necessarily going, this made me think of that quick write that we wrote the other day. Um, <laughs> but I would say probably the getting started yeah. each day has been, um, and going back and rereading your piece to get started again, because the quick writes, they, when they go to share, they have to go back and reread their piece. And a lot of times that's the first book I wrote that was on close writing was on how infrequently our kids go back and read their own writing and how unfamiliar mm -hmm. their writing is to them sometimes. And so when it's a short, quick piece, very easy to invite them to go back in and read their piece. And is, was it complete? Did it say what you wanted it to say kind of a thing? Um, so I think it's kind of built that habit into their writing too. Um, Paula, I was wondering, um, uh, you have a whole chapter on the social emotional quick rights. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, you see uh, a lot of districts in our area, New York State or across the United States that um, educators are really starting to focus more on that social emotional piece. Um, can you tell us um, just with working with students with those specific sparks, um, some of the things that you've noticed um, has been um, positive for students using those? So like I, the, the section that I do talks about like the three M's, like the mindfulness, metacognition and mindset, those, you know, as those mm -hmm. areas. One of the things I think that's been super helpful is some of the quick writes that we do that give kids kind of scenarios. So a lot of times it's very hard to problem solve or to think yourself through something when you're emotionally charged. So our kids who right. who lack self-regulation skills and need a lot of practice with that, when we like give them some examples of things to work through when they're kind of calm um, and can flexibly think in a quick write. So then when those situations come up, um, they're less charged. So we've, there's a couple of like, you know, um, there's a quick, quick write that I do in some classrooms. Like the teacher asked you to pick up a pencil on the floor, but you didn't drop it there. Okay. This is a big one that sets kids off sometimes. I didn't do that. That's not my pencil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so 
and kids that you can't talk them through like i know but it would be so helpful if you helped in the classroom <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And they're just like but it's not mine it's all you know okay so take some situations that kind of kids get set off sometimes give them some opportunities just like give them that quick right what would you do what would you say and then when they share ideas is there a commonality between how kids respond um and i tell them like be really honest you know because some kids are like i would say uh, yes i will <laughs> it's our responsibility for everybody that, well there's not too many kids in the classroom that that's really thing Look, most <laughs> say something like i do it but i tell her that it's not mine i'm like that yeah. oh, well, can you you know like how would, then we talk about well how would you tell her kind of thing but so things like mm. that it's kind of fun it's like a rehearsal of situations that kids find themselves in commonly and it's fun because kids will come up with one she's like you know what we ought to have for a quick write is this because it's something that happens. uh yeah and it's like they're thinking how how would how would you handle this one you know sometimes they'll ask me well how would you handle things i'm like well let's write about that but so that's a really good use of it and it's you know again three to five minutes and kids get an opportunity to practice some skills that when when are you going to fit that into your curriculum really mm -hmm. you know, guidance counselor comes in maybe if you're lucky to have a guidance counselor who does classroom guidance um or if a kid's sent to the office and they have to process you know what would you do next time? And they're probably not going to think about what they do next time. They're just mad that they got caught and they're, they're trying to like, you know, tell you their side of the story kind of a thing. So those are some of the things that are, that are kind of, um, and uh, some other ones that we do is like, you know, what makes somebody a good partner to work with? Or what would you do if you, you, you know, your teacher assigned you to work with somebody you really didn't get along with? What would you do kind of a thing? And you keep it kind of anonymous there. Um, mm -hmm. I think that really helps kids to, Go, well what would I do and sometimes they're embarrassed to like tell how they would honestly handle a situation when they have to mm -hmm. rationally think about what they would typically say right. or do. when they have to write it down when they're calm it doesn't they're sort of like embarrassed but when they're emotional they're not embarrassed because they're just like so angry they can't think about how this doesn't make sense or um, how you know how it might be perceived by others they just they just only know how they want to viscerally react to something. So that's been a good one to try with kiddos. I'm thinking I should try this with my daughters at home. <laughs> my 10 and seven year old. <laughs> that's um, great. Um, Paula, I was wondering, you know, after, you know, there's, there's quite a few or they're starting to build up some of their quick rights. Um, what are, what are your teachers usually doing as far as, how are they looking over them and um, maybe planning for some lessons based on some of the patterns that they see with students? Um, have your teachers found some kind of rule of thumb uh, way of looking at them or how often or things like that? So a lot of times they just look for volume because it's like, mm -hmm. you know, like, are you, are you getting it? You know, if we've been writing for five minutes and you're still only writing five words, sometimes we do a math thing and like, do you know how many words a minute you're writing? Do you know how many, you know, letters of, you know, those kinds of mm -hmm. things. Um, it's, it's a lot of volume things, but the biggest impact that can come is not from the teacher looking over them and evaluating, but giving them invitations to go back and, and, and look their own. Oh, look for patterns those. So what are you noticing? Like look over the last three days. What are you, what are some things that you're noticing? Um, mm -hmm. it's almost like having open ended sorts or closed sorts, you know, for math or yes. kinds of things. It's like you could have a closed observation kind of be like, look to see, you know, like, did you vary your sentences or I, I actually, I don't even know if I'd want to do that one very much because it, it's not necessarily supposed to be narrative looking, but it's just like, I don't know. It, it, it'd probably be more process related that we've asked kids to do. Um, okay. I have had teachers who, yeah. have kids, you know, who write the same way every time. Because some kids, like, it's linear, line, 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 line. Look back through your quick write. I've had a teacher do this. Look back through your quick write notebook. Is there, have you tried something other than linear narrative writing? Mm -hmm. Okay, no, that's fine. Just, just was wondering kind of a thing. But not like you might want to try because I don't want to necessarily tell them they have to do something. But it's just like... What are you noticing kind of a thing? Um, the whole idea is that they know it's never gonna be graded and it's really never gonna yeah. be. Graded. And so I don't really wanna, I almost feel like if I said something like it would sound evaluative, like, oh, is yeah. it supposed to be this way kind of a thing? So I think the mm -hmm. biggest thing that teachers have looked at is just volume. Are you writing the whole time? Because if we're writing for five minutes and you only have a few words, remember our only rule is really you're writing the whole time. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of the, 
I mean, I might look through kids' things to see like what are they writing about or, um, you know, you could definitely use it as a form. Well, we do use it as a formative assessment when we write informational. Okay. Because that's okay. how I can tell if kids have misconceptions about, cons uh, about um, topics or content, um, uh, what they might need to learn about. You know, if we do a quick write before a unit of study in science and they, um, they already have, most of the kids have some key concepts. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. That's what I might use it for mostly, um, for those kinds of things. But I don't necessarily think for quality of writing, because it's not really about quality of writing. It's about getting thinking on paper kind of a thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. And I think that's, that's the key takeaway. It's one of the key takeaways is it's not evaluative and how to like keep from going down that slippery slope. And I, I think, think you know, the observations could go there. Yeah, as soon as you suggest, like, you know, have you tried something? They're going to be like, oh, should I have tried? You know, like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That comes across as a value of like, I'd really like it if you tried this kind of a thing and you haven't done it yet, kind of a thing. So. Yeah, I think that we have to be so careful about our word choice with that. Yeah, and and you know sometimes we are so time compelled we want to like suck every little bit out of everything that we do in our classrooms. It's like, what could I? what can I mine from this? But maybe it's like, maybe I don't want to. Feel yeah. Like I want to do that kind of a thing. And especially if it, if, if it might, you know, intimidate them and make them feel like, Oh, is she going to be checking this all the time? I might, might switch up. Cause they, they do have the option of, you know, um, saying, I don't want to share. I do tell kids though about like, um, if I ever find like that you might be, you know, what is the, terminology you use you know like you might be in a hurtful situation or you might have you know be in danger of being harmed when I read from you um I will talk to you about this and I might talk to, I might talk to our guidance counselor or something about it so kids know mm -hmm. if they write something like last night you know something that happened at home that I feel like wow that's a dangerous situation but if they just write about who they like and who they don't like you know they they have they have to know that I'm never going to talk to them about anything in their writing that's super personal and um some kids kids write on the top do not read <laughs> <laughs> it's like okay you know <clears throat> but, <laughs> and if i'm pretty sure that this kid's not in danger for anything there's probably no no reason for me to ever want to read that page so <laughs> right right paula do you have some uh kind of favorite sparks or type of sparks that um you let you usually gravitate to with students or you just enjoy uh, working with students with specific ones? So I, you tend to do a lot of photographs and images because they're sort of, like I said, for kids who can't read English, um, yeah. limited language skills, it's universal language. There are a lot of images, but the ones like, um, that Google, have you seen the Google photo album that I have? Mm -hmm. Oh, that, kids love that because it's what I, it's mine. Like you took that. Yeah. They want yeah. To, what's the story behind that? And I'll tell them, well, I'm not going to tell you the story behind it until after we do our spark or whatever, but, um, they like that because it's a personal connection to their teacher. So I really encourage teachers mm -hmm. to like start, if you don't do a Google photo album, do something like make a real photo album or something. But, bring a piece of your life into the classroom and kids will respond. They'll be so curious. They'll, um, that's some of their favorite ones. Um, some of my favorite ones are, are some of those social emotional ones where I really get to know the kids. Like you put, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you don't often have time to have those conversations with kids because you're just, there's 23 kids in this room and I'm only here for 40 minutes and I'm into this room with 23 kids. And, um, so I really can get to know them really intimately. Really um, see their senses of humor sometimes, see their vulnerabilities. You really see your kids in a different way when you don't see them as a kid sitting in a seat. You see them as yeah. a seat. The, the idea of like imagine your kids at home sleeping at night and you're like, oh, okay, I have so much more patience when you can picture them like, you know, just sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you really get to know them as, as little people, as human beings and not students, um, you, it just takes on a whole different perspective. And so those are the ones that I, I like to look through and read, but they really like the picture, the photographs and things like that. Mm. And I, I, I found myself, I have boxes and boxes of printed pictures of uh, photographs. And this week or over vacation, I've been 
kind of looking through them and now it's it's neat because now I'm looking at them through some of them of my own children that were younger that I don't remember the story behind it you know just a real basic place yeah uh, so it's it's kind of neat so I've been kind of collecting those to kind of share with students and uh, but it's it's neat to kind of look at those photographs that I've already taken with that kind of lens of oh can someone write off this yeah yeah I mean, they, they love it. They're just like, who is that? Is that your son? Is that your daughter? And yeah. Who are you? And is that real? And I, I'm just so intrigued. Um, yeah. You don't have to tell them to get started. They're just like, I know what I'm going to write. Off they go kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, That's great. <laughs> well, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for talking to us. And yeah. oh. Paula, did you have any last thoughts that yeah. you wanted to leave uh, with us before we go? I, just if you, you know, what I'll do is I'll check back with you guys after, you know, um, you, you finish your, your book study this summer. And if, um, I'd love it if any of your teachers want to reach out to me and tell me how it goes in their classrooms, um, my email and stuff, everything's on my, like on my website. I'd love yes. to email me or yeah. just tweet me and they'll say, we did this in our classroom today. Um, or if they have ideas, um, but like the Padlet, um, you know, how did they, did they use those? Did they, did they think the resources were, you know, helpful in any way? They have ideas for other resources. I'd love to hear from them on that too, but I really would love to hear from any of your teachers how things are going, so. All right. Absolutely. Well, thank you. We're very excited yeah. to be able to share this with the rest of the people in the group, and um, thank you for giving us your time um, to meet with us tonight. Well, thanks for talking with me, guys. It's, it's yes. been fun. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you so much, Paula. I appreciate it. All right. We'll stay in touch. Okay. We'll do. Thank Bye. you. Bye. <laughs> All right. That was good. Hang on one second.